This episode of Revision Path is brought to you by Facebook Design. One thing that I love asking guests on the show is what advice they would give to an up-and-coming designer. When I talked with product designer Jessica Durkin, I asked her what's the best advice she's been given about design. So for me, that's simple. I think the best advice I've been given about design is just to focus on the people you're designing for and what they need. And if you don't know what they need, come up with a plan to learn. Learn more at facebook.com forward slash design. Are you looking for a job? Do you know someone who's looking for a job? Then check out our job board over at revisionpath.com forward slash jobs. Whether you want a full-time job or you're looking for something temporary or freelance, we've got you covered. Here at Revision Path, we're currently looking for a design writer to join our team. We also have job listings from Indeed.com, so head to the Revision Path job board at revisionpath.com forward slash jobs to apply and to search for any other listings. Don't forget to sign up for weekly job alerts so when there are new positions added to the job board, you'll get an email so you can be the first to apply. Again, that's revisionpath.com forward slash jobs. See you there. You're listening to the Revision Path Podcast, a weekly showcase of the world's black graphic designers, web designers, and web developers. Through in-depth interviews, you'll learn about their work, their goals, and what inspires them as creative individuals. Here's your host, Maurice Cherry. Welcome to the Revision Path Podcast. My name is Maurice Cherry, and before we get into this week's interview, let's talk about our sponsors, MailChimp, Hover, and SiteGround. MailChimp gives you the marketing tools you need to be yourself on a bigger stage. So whether that's big business or freelance work, you can join more than 15 million people who use MailChimp to grow their businesses on their own terms. And with integrated Facebook and Instagram advertising, you can find new customers and reconnect with others. Sign up for a free account today at MailChimp.com. MailChimp. Send better email. When you have a great idea for a project, you need to give it a great domain name. And guess what? Finding that perfect domain name is ridiculously easy with Hover. You know, domain names aren't just for websites. You can use them to create a more professional, on-brand email address for yourself. I mean, if you've already got the domain that you want, why not just go the extra step with your email address? And if you need a hand, Hover's awesome support team is there to help you. Go to hover.com forward slash revision path and get 10% off your first purchase. Again, that's hover.com forward slash revision path. Hover, domain names for your ideas. SiteGround's hosting services are crafted for professional, business, or enterprise projects. Whether you're building something custom or you're using a CMS like WordPress, SiteGround lets you build better, faster, safer websites more easily, and they offer multiple hosting options that your websites can grow into. Visit SiteGround.com forward slash revision path to get 60% off on all hosting plans. Now for this week's interview. I'm talking with author, speaker, consultant, and digital governance expert Lisa Welchman. Let's start the show. All right, so tell us who you are and what you do. I am Lisa Welchman, and I'm probably best known for being a digital governance consultant, and that means that I help usually pretty large organizations, but they don't have to be big, figure out what accountabilities and roles and responsibilities are inside the org. So basically, you know, anyone who's worked as a designer, UX person, whatever, developer, inside the digital space in a large org probably runs up against challenges around decision making, whether or not it's a decision making around something like a color palette or what type of code to use. Oftentimes, they're just challenges about who gets to sort of have the final say in things. So that's sort of the crux and the illustration of a governance problem. So I go into organizations and help people decide who does get to make decisions right around these things. And hopefully what will happen is it'll sort of turn down the internal battles in the organization, help people speed things up and help people create stuff with more intention and hopefully higher quality, but mostly keep people from fighting so much, which is a good thing (laughs) at work. So that's one thing I do. Um, I also blog a little bit on Medium and write articles, digital ethics, all kinds of different things um, that I like to write about on Medium. I've written a book called Managing Chaos, Digital Governance by Design. And I speak a lot. I do a lot of talks. I've had kind of a slow year this year, but Generally speaking, I do a fair amount of, um, you know, event speaking as well. Nice. Sounds like a jack of all trades, Jill of all trades, I guess I should say. 
Well, I hope I've mastered something, though. The second part of that is that I actually don't know what I'm doing in any of them. So let's hope that's not the case. (laughs) How did you first get involved with digital governance? That's easy. I cut my teeth in the digital space in the mid-90s, sort of the first wave of the web in Silicon Valley. And I used to be the web publishing program manager at Cisco Systems for Cisco.com. So basically... I was responsible for the systems that help publish all this content to the web. And that was a lot. At that time, they had maybe 200, 250,000 web pages, maybe more, which was a lot in 1996. That was a big site. And they had multilingual. They also had multi-channel publishing, which was very unusual at the time. In fact, the people who established that and sort of wrote the algorithms and designed that system, which happened prior to me getting there, actually got an award from the Smithsonian for actually doing that. And it's interesting because people are still challenged by multi-channel delivery. But anyhow, I arrived there. My first job was maintaining the product pages. And then I moved quickly into sort of working on all of the uh, publishing tools for that. And one of the things that I really noticed really early on was that, you know, Cisco is a technology company that you would think would understand the internet and the web, right? <laughs> so, right. But they still had problems managing their website. And, and that was really interesting to me that a company that was all about the internet and web couldn't manage its website, which meant that there was really no relationship between how much you know about the internet and web and how well you can actually manage the website. So that, that's an actual management challenge, being able to get a very large organization to work in concert as a team to deliver this huge online diverse artifact. It was a challenge. It's probably still a challenge there. And so I left in 1999 because I was more interested in sort of focusing on that dynamic and understanding why it was that organizations had problems publishing online and why we're marketing and IT always arguing with each other all the time about anything they could argue. You know, is the web a a technology tool or is it a marketing tool or is it a business tool? Like those sorts of debates are still what that was 99. We're almost 20 years since I've left. And people are still having those debates as well. So I started my own business in 1999, and that's sort of evolved over the years. It got acquired maybe four or five years ago, and then that company got acquired. But, you know, all the time I've been working sort of in this space, developing methodology, working with different sized companies down different vertical spaces, higher ed, governmental, NGO, Fortune 1000, Global 100, you name it. I sort of have worked with that to sort of work through those problems. So that's sort of how I got into it and how it's evolved a little bit. Yeah, I'm remembering how the web was back in like the mid mid to late 90s. And it really, I mean, this is like pre quote unquote web 2.0. So it really was this time. Yeah, no social at all. Yeah, yeah, no social. But it was really this time when companies were trying to figure out what it meant to have a web presence. And like you said, it's that that debate of should this be, you know, informational, should it be e-commerce, like like what sort of function should their website have? A lot of companies were still really trying to figure that out. Well, they were still trying to figure out should they have one, right? Uh, or was this, was this web thing going to be something that was just this fly-by-night crazy? When I left in 1999, there were still organizations that were questioning whether or not they even needed an online presence at all. Mm -hmm. right? And what it was going to achieve. I mean, what was interesting about being at Cisco is that they had this huge e-commerce component. So this huge B2B e-commerce component showing that you can sell stuff online, right? In in a huge business case, not just B2C, but B2B, right? And so that was really um, an interesting component as well. But I have a theory about just sort of digital and the online space, which is whatever your organization is in total, and that means everything that it does, right? From its administrative constructs, to what you sell or what you promote, if you're mission driven and not sort of as much money driven, what you're actually trying to do is manifest that full capacity of the business online, which means it's multifaceted. Mm -hmm. I think organizations fall into a really huge trap when they think it's all marketing or it's all sales or it's all, it's just a business card website. The reality is you're taking whatever you are as an organization and you're re-manifesting online. And that takes time. And it also, as I mentioned before, presses the organization because it means if you don't know how to work together, like in your office, right, (laughs) all that stuff's going to show up online. I wrote this uh, 
ebook years ago called Digital Deca 10 Management Truths for the Web Age or something like that. And it was a long time ago because I, instead of saying social media, I said Web 2.0 in it. But it, other than the fact that I'm saying Web 2.0, everything that I wrote back then still could be true, right? And organizations are dysfunctional by their nature. It's not natural to get tens of thousands or even thousands of people together and expect them to work together easily, right? And websites and social channels and mobile apps, whatever you want to call it, or whatever, however way you're, you're using the technology, insists that that happens. It insists that you work in concert, right? Because you're building these applications that are pulling from multiple parts of the business, and it exposes just how messed up organizations really are, which is the fun part of my job. I mean, it's almost sublime because it's not, I mean, it's, I don't say that to be like there, everyone is that way. It's very exposing, just like the web is exposing a lot of political things right now, right? This is a really rough year, a lot, rough couple of years politically. It's just exposing, it just shows so much and it moves things so quickly. And so that happens with organizations and they're really trying to catch up and figure out what does that mean and how do we operate differently? You know, it's been 20 years for most organizations, 20 plus years, but that's still relatively early. It just takes time. And if you look at the history of the telegraph, radio, television, any new technology, it takes more than 20 years for it to penetrate, right, and become mature Mm -hmm. and reach that sort of golden age moment, right? It just doesn't happen overnight like that. You know, so we're making our way, for better or for worse, to somewhere. (laughs) And I mean, the stuff that you're talking about with digital governance, I mean, that applies, of course, to big organizations. I'm also thinking how governance even applies to whether you're working in-house with a team or even if you're a freelancer and you're working with a company. It's always kind of important that steps in the project to determine who's doing what, who's going to be responsible for what, how do we kind of make this happen. One thing that I know I hear about a lot you know, from entrepreneurs, for example, when it comes to like clients from hell and all this kind of stuff, I feel it usually boils down to an issue of governance with not really clearly communicating as early as possible within the project, who's going to be responsible for what and how that dictates kind of how the rest of the project goes. Whenever I hear there are some, you know, flaws in the project or we ran into this snafu because the client thought that the vendor was going to do this. And then the vendor thought the client was doing this, but nobody really, communicated clearly who was going to do what, like it wasn't spelled out in a document or something that both parties kind of had so they could know that. Yeah. I mean, I think there, there are different levels of it. I mean, I have a maturity curve in the book and I use it a lot when I talk to clients. And one of the things that I say is you don't want to govern too early. Right. And so that means when you're just trying something out or you're sort of brainstorming or trying to figure out what you're going to make, whether or not you're a small team or a large team doesn't really matter. You don't want to put too many constraints on, right? Because then you may not find sort of the secret sauce, right? You might not be able to invent that secret sauce that's going to, or the new innovative thing. Mm -hmm. But that said, I'll have to say, I mean, I just recently, we put up a digital governance website. We put up uh, a colleague and I put one up together. And you would think, we both have worked in this space for, you know, 20 plus years, right? (laughs) You would think we'd have it together. But even just two people, there are governance problems in marriages, right? There are governance problems mm-hmm. in families. And usually it has to do with expectations and what people assume is the case based on their experience, right? So their experience in the workplace, their experience working in the department they work in with the boss that they have, right? The set of information that they know and don't know. And so it isn't, you know, I talk about large companies because usually I'm working with large companies because they have really big sticky problems, but you don't have to be big to have a governance problem. And you don't have to write a big document to sort it out. You know, for a smaller team that's sort of brainstorming or designing something new, you might want to just sit down over a cup of coffee or drink or something or a meal and just talk about the rules of the road, right? Just make sure you guys are sort of, are we going to Kansas? Oh, no, no, I didn't think we were going to Kansas. I thought we were going to Utah. It's like, okay, let's get this straight. We're going to Kansas, right? Like, And, you know, that strategy, that component right there, like, where are we going? (laughs) Like, what are we trying to get? That's usually the one that's just completely not there. Yeah. Right. People start executing because someone says, make an app, right? Or somebody else makes an app and it's taking some of your business and someone's like, make, that's not like a business goal, right? That's a tactical goal. And so you get into this community of makers who are just making things and they're not really making things to the same end. So just 
having those quick conversations to make sure that the fundamentals are solid is great for a team that's just trying to be innovative and light and doesn't want to write down a bunch of policies and standards, right? And doesn't need a, a racy chart for roles and responsibilities. But you'd be surprised how often people just don't have a conversation. You know, I start projects and 50% of the time, somebody says at the first meeting when I show up and we're having our sort of orientation, someone says something like, this is the first time we've ever gotten in a room and talked about this stuff as a team together. <laughs> now, they, they get in project meetings all the time, fighting with each other, like two <laughs> or three of them and two or three of those, right? So it's not like they don't talk to each other, but to talk about how they work together, right? They don't have that conversation. I don't know why, but maybe it's some little quirky thing about human nature. Maybe it's as simple as they're working too fast and don't have time to think about it. The reward structure for employees is usually around tactical things, right? Mm -hmm. You don't get a prize for working well together with your colleagues. You get a prize because you built that app and you got it out on time, right? So those are some of the things we sort of look at and, and try to tweak for people so that they can actually start working well together, which is really what governance is about. It's about good collaboration. Now, you wrote a book called Managing Chaos, <laughs> Digital Governance by Design. When did you kind of decide that it was time for you to to write a book? Like, when did you decide that you needed to take what you learned and put it into something like this? Oh, that was many years ago. Now, getting it done, that's a different thing. Probably really around 2007, 2008, something like around that time was when I wanted to start writing about things because we'd started to see some patterns, right, about how people work together. And we'd started as consultants to develop methodology around it repeatable methodology that we could use. And so the goal for that book really is to put some language around the challenges that people face when trying to make things for the digital sphere, right? They're just not particularly unique challenges, but the nuances are unique, right? So people have been trying to collaborate together around technologies forever, right? I'm sure the first bonfire had people arguing about when you put more wood on, right? <laughs> and when you don't, pour, or I mean, like, this just is how people are. You're there, there's always stuff to argue about. So that's not a challenge, but there's some unique challenges with digital because of its pace and speed and the skill set. When those started to become clear to me, I thought, oh, let me start thinking about writing these down. So it took me a while to get it done. I had a couple of illnesses, the recession, a bunch of things like that, but eventually I got there. And now with the book, I mean, I know you speak, you know, all over the world on a number of issues. When it comes down to digital governance, since, you know, that's kind of what we've been talking about, what do you kind of see companies and organizations doing wrong? I know before you mentioned, you know, maybe it's it's getting into the conversation too quickly. It's maybe not even having the conversation at all. But for people that are listening, I'm sure they want to know how can they take this concept of digital governance and try to apply it to their business or to their work? I think one of the things, if I had to pick one, and I will pick one, usually I hate picking one thing, but I one sticking out in my head, so I'll just say it. I think, and it's not actually a sort of a, a work thing, it's a, it's a human factor, and that's fear, right? So you're at work, you're at your job, you're making your app, your mobile site, you're a content strategist, you're a UX person, you're on the hook for getting this stuff done you have somehow managed to wrestle enough authority, right, and power to get it done, right? Nobody actually gave it to you. Somebody asked you to do something and you had to, it requires you to have a number of relationships with developers or designers or writers or whatever. And somehow you've managed to get all of that done. And you've built this sort of bubble of productivity around yourself or your team, if you want to extend it a little farther, and you're actually able to get stuff done. The last thing you want to do is dismantle that, right? <laughs> or run the risk of dismantling it. So instead of going and fixing that thing that you know is weird, right? Like the fact that you know the only reason why your code got done on time is because you're good friends with that developer, right? Which isn't a good reason for the code to get done on time, right? But that you're leveraging personal relationships you just stay in that space because you don't want to undo things. And so what happens is you don't have the dialogue that you need to have with your colleagues about how can we make it so that everybody's working well together? It's not just about personal relationships with people. And so that fear of sort of dismantling the barely functional system that you have 
because you're afraid that you will never get any kind of, you know, anything in the place of that that's actually ever going to be productive actually holds people up from having a real conversation about decision making. You know, you're afraid that you might lose some authority. Mm -hmm. You might know that you really shouldn't be making decisions about design factors for, you know, the front end of an app, right? But you do, and you get things done, and you don't want to lose that power because you're afraid things will slow down. So that's just kind of a mismatch of things, dysfunction going along. And again, I'll use the family analogy. Families are like that, right? You know, Uncle Greg's a bigot, and he swears a lot, and he farts, right? (laughs) But nobody's going to say that, right? Because that's who he is. And he's got some power in the family or whatever the case may be, right? We tolerate dysfunctional behaviors for the sake of the means to get other things done, right? All the time in life. And so when you apply that to this type of situation, it slows things down and it makes them weird, right? And so people don't like confronting that. And so I think the number one thing people do is just they don't put their own fears down for the sake of really the end user of the experience that they're creating. They actually put all of that stuff ahead of that. For as much as UX people love to talk about the user's experience, oftentimes the user's experience is behind their own experience of feeling good at work, right? Mm -hmm. They don't want to go step into a discomfort zone in order to really do the work that needs to get done so that we can really have that really good integrated app where we're able to, you know, use data from this group over here and that group over there. And, you know, it's, it's not, I'm not saying that it's sort of in a mean way, but it's an observation. It's a challenge, right? Because there are power structures built up in these businesses and sort of digital cuts across those, right? It's very, very hard to break down, yeah. right? And if you're just going to work every day and you got to have your job and your paycheck means something to you and you don't want to mess with it, you don't. Right. And so um, it's certainly not finger pointing. I understand why, but it causes problems. Right. It causes a lot of problems. And it it also leaves the organization really, really ripe for I hate to use that word for disruption from the outside, because not only are you not doing your best work to begin with, you're not actually getting organized. So if your business model is attacked by, you know, some startup from somewhere, you're not even organized to react. Yeah. Right. You're re- it's really, really a challenge. And so, um, you know, that's just going to continue. And what will happen is some people will get blockbusted out and other people will figure it out in time and others won't. It'll be a mix of, of things that, mm-hmm. you know, reactions that happen inside businesses. So it's kind of a long winded answer and not a very specific one. So the advice would be. Get out of your comfort zone. Yeah. Right. And take the steps that you need to actually have those difficult conversations with your colleagues about where decisions ought to be being being made, right? Are there any sort of projects that you're working on now? I know before we recorded, you mentioned that you just got back from vacation. Yeah, I am. Are there, are there any projects that you're about to go into now for this year? Yeah, we're getting ready to do with a project, um, I won't name them directly, with some folks in within the UN sector. And that should be really an interesting project I like working with NGOs and I like working with governments sometimes. I don't say all the time, but uh, the reason why I'm saying I like working with them is because their mission affects so many different types of people, right? And I also think one of the aspects or one of the areas where I want to find clarity for digital governance is around strategy and who sets the strategy, digital strategy for an organization. So if you're working with an NGO or someone that sort of has a what I consider to be a heart-based mission as opposed to a fiscally-based mission, talking about that and figuring out who needs to be in the room when you make decisions about what you're going to do strategically with digital, right? So there's all sorts of rights issues and political issues that could be addressed using online tools and techniques. So how far do you want to stretch with that or not stretch with that? And then naturally, you know, what would flow with that would be certain policies and standards that would actually support support that strategy. So um, I'm looking forward to working on that. I would like to see governance and NGOs stretch out a little bit in terms of doing things other than just deciding to have a nice looking website, right? Like that would be great. And most organizations are struggling just with that, right? Like just (laughs) trying to have an integrated website. But think about that. It's 20 years in, right? And we can't even build the car, let alone drive it, right? So 
sometimes we can get it running or this part runs over here or that part runs over here, but this holistic thing. So I think the opportunities for what can be achieved globally through some of these organizations, if they'd like to sort of reinvent themselves through the lens, right, of digital, keeping hold of their mission, but reevaluating what types of things they can do. And those types of decisions to be that aggressive about digital, like figuring out different ways to use mobile apps in the field, right, to actually help people with challenges. Those sorts of things and decisions really need to be made by fairly senior level people in an organization. And oftentimes those are the people the most engaged. They look at the website or the online experience as just that. It's a communications tool. It looks pretty good. It's not embarrassing us. It, we aren't getting hacked. Therefore, it is good. And I'm like, <laughs> Well, you know, I'm, uh, those are good things, but to me, those are basics. Basically, you're saying, I know how to make one of these, right? And thinking that you win, right? Mm. It doesn't actually do anything that our organization wants it to do other than not embarrass us and it doesn't leave us vulnerable to, you know, online attacks and things like that. But it's actually not really doing anything, right, to support the mission of the organization. That's not good enough. And so I think in this next wave over the next probably next 20 year cycle, it'd be really great to see some maturity. The UK, you know, has been all over the press for what they've done online with their website and, and government and consolidating all of these bursts on the web and consolidating them down into one experience. And whether you like what they've done or not done, it was aggressive, right? And they were trying to be forward thinking about what is the real experience? How can we actually transform government using these digital platforms? I just got my is it e, it's not citizenship. It's an e-resident, my Estonian e-residency card, right? Oh. So, you know, Estonia is very, very aggressive, super small country, very aggressive about the use of digital. They've put everything online, right? So. Taxes, grades for school, all sorts of different types of things. And if you're not from Estonia, you can apply to have an e-residency, which means you can, you know, run a business online right, from Estonia. And so there are all kinds of really aggressive things that could be done in government and in that space that aren't necessarily being done. So early days, I mean, people think we're like deep in this stuff. And it's just like, mm -mm, not yet. <laughs> but, well, no, I mean, it's just not, it's good. It's good. I'm not, I'm not poo-pooing anything. I'm not saying a lot hasn't changed. It's stunning right. how fast we've all gone online. For those of us who have access, most people on the planet don't have access to the internet. Yeah. Still. So there's all kinds of stuff that still needs to get done. Not saying for other people to pull back, but just be mindful of, you know, that balance. But anyhow, so that's, that's a long-winded way, again, of talking about a project I'm working on. But I'm looking forward to that. I'm really interested in that Estonia e-residency. Yeah, know that, you should go for it. Anybody can I, apply. I want to check into it because I know that Estonia <laughs> is a country that has, I know it has really good internet in terms of, uh, public penetration because it's one of the countries that has declared internet access a basic human right. Well, the UN did that. Like the UN declared that as a human right. And not everybody's picked up on that, right? Access to the internet. Like that's a big deal. I mean, think about it. I mean, that internet governance component piece, which is this above what I do, right? That informs the work that I do, which is digital governance, which is happening in an individual organization. That's huge. And no one pays enough attention to that, including me. Right. The laws that are being built about who has access to information and how open or closed it's going to be. That's really big right now. I'm looking it up online, actually, as yeah. we're recording. Estonia is has the second best public Wi-Fi in the world. It tops the global Internet freedom chart. It's also one of the most wired countries in the world. That's that's astonishing. And it's such a like you said, it's a small country, but they've kind of really stepped forward with making sure everything is digital. Well, see, and there's probably a relationship between those two factors that you just mentioned, small and comprehensiveness, right? Yeah. So it's really hard to do stuff in a big country across mm. the board. We can't even make a train system run here. And there are a variety of different reasons <laughs> that probably have to do with lobbyists and things like that. So that's not the only reason. But you go to smaller countries and sometimes they've got it more together, right? Because it takes less. But it also takes intention, right? You have to decide to want to have interoperability, right? It doesn't just happen that things are interoperable. You decide that they are and you create standards and you share them. Like that's governance, right? And so people always think governance is like this thing that slows things down. 
And it might slow thing down the process of creation in some instances, right? But then it makes things move super fast, right? Like it's, it's just like it's taking the time to build it right, mm-hmm. right? So that it will scale with integrity and that it can be changed, right? So APIs are great for that reason. I mean, there's all kinds of, of things that are about creating standards that people follow. And you know, one of the things I mention in my book and almost every time I give a talk is – you know, the web is standards based. That's why it's so good. Mm -hmm. You can't just like type anything you want in notepad. I'm showing my age and push it through a web browser and think it's going to render. That ain't how it works, right? It does not work like that, right? It's standards based, right? And it's scaled so quickly because it's standards based, right? And so, you know, people and organizations need to create the sort their own sort of internal W3C, right, mm-hmm. in their organization so that they can have that same sort of scalability and interoperability. And, you know, deciding what that is and how that ought to be is sort of the work of governance. But anyhow, we weren't talking about that. We were talking about Estonia. But Estonia is good because they took the time to do that, right? And it was easy for them to do it because they're small. Yeah. Right. And so the bigger you are, the harder it is and the more likely you're not going to take it on, which is why, again, you end up sort of being a little bit vulnerable. And if you if you just are unlucky, if you have an unlucky business model, you know, I, I used to want to write this piece for years and I've never written it because probably it takes more data than I actually have access to or maybe even exists, which is, you know, what leaves an organization vulnerable to disruption. Right. And one of the things that was clear really early on is the easier it is for your business model to be digitized, the more in trouble you are, which is why publishing and media were just so vulnerable so early, right? So if you make tires, not so much, right? You know, if you're just doing things, if you're pulling oil out of the ground, not so much, right? But if there are things that you can do that are easy to digitize, it really, really leaves you vulnerable. And people just didn't see it. They didn't see it. They didn't believe it early enough. And so, and then there's sneaky things like, you know, limousine service, taxi and limousine service. Who would have thought that until you had mobile apps, right? And who would have thought, you know, hotels until you had mobile apps and an Airbnb and all sorts of things, right? So it just comes in waves. And I'm sure there are things right now that we think are completely rock solid that are turning, like the acquisition of Whole Foods by Amazon. Literally, I saw that and... You know, I don't know what I feel about it ethically, morally, or whatever. I haven't thought about it. But just from a few, pure business head, like girl geek zone, I just like, I think my heart sped up. I was like, oh my God, what are they going to do? Yeah. Right? Like, because it's going to be something, right? <laughs> right? It's just, it's going to be something and it's going to turn over the way we think about something like going to the grocery store. I mean, I've, I use Peapod. I live in Baltimore. I live use Peapod and get my groceries delivered all the time. And I know people do meal kits and all kinds of other things, but just the mind blowing possibility of the combination of those two things. But, you know, it's just amazing. So that's why I think, you know, I probably won't live to see the sort of golden age of the internet and the web, right? I'm 53 years old and I think we've at least got another 30, 40 years. So maybe I will actually, that could be. I could be, I'll be really old. How about that? I'll be really old when we get to the point where it's kind of like the golden age of the internet and web and everything's working and we've got digital natives who are grandparents and, you know, like all of this stuff will just be like, well, no, I mean, some of it's just like, it's new to me. Like I'm old enough that this stuff's still new. Like I don't even, I work in this space and I'm still a little analog. So anyhow, it's all good. Good times. Yeah, with the whole Amazon Whole Foods purchase, I feel like Amazon really just bought into, I mean, of course, it's the way that they're positioning it is like, oh, we're changing, you know, how people will buy groceries online. But also Amazon is accessing a number of different, that's the best way to put it, like distribution centers in a way where it's that's right. Whole Foods, they aren't just yeah. built. Yeah. Very certain neighborhoods. That's right. The demographic. Yep. Yeah, it's all about reaching yeah. those demographics. So it's not that they just bought a chain of grocery stores. They bought these very personal. No, this isn't Price Club. This isn't yeah. Price Club. <laughs> yeah, they did. These it's upper middle class, you know, whole paycheck. They earn their earn their name. And I mean, I'm not 
you know, I'm shopping there. I'm buying my organic veggies there and getting my creams and my, you know, all that other kind of stuff from, you know, certain things that I'll go to the Whole Foods Market for because they're here local. It's going to be interesting. Again, I haven't done, I'm a little bit anal. I haven't done enough reading and research or whatever. And I know some people just hate Amazon because of the work ethic uh, there and the, and the way things happen, happen there as well. But just sort of coldly from a business perspective, it's interesting. It's just really interesting. And, you know, I've always been an Amazon admirer. It's just because the scale and brazenness of the business model. Uh -huh. It's just, it's, you know, it's just a fascinating company to me in, in a lot of different ways. I mean, they're really different to Google and different to then, you know, all these other big companies, obviously, Apple and Microsoft and stuff like that. But there's just something about the sort of slow and introverted pace that they keep and steady. They're marathoners, right? They it's just, so I don't know what it is, but, you know, <laughs> Microsoft's up there, but I guess, you know, Microsoft's kind of was slow and steady too. It's not a show off -y kind of, and I might just be referring to Jeff Bezos. I might just be thinking about the CEO. He's not a show off -y kind of guy, Yeah. right? He just kind of sits back and does stuff. And you're like, oh, wow, you bought the Washington Post. Hmm, that's interesting. <laughs> Oh, you bought Whole Foods. That oh, you bought Audible. Hmm, that's really interesting. Oh, you bought you now you're making your own furniture to sell on Amazon. Oh, and clothes too. Hmm. You know, you're just sitting here going, it's just it's you're like, okay. It's okay. Yeah. It's all good. So but it's interesting how much, you know, has just changed in the last twenty years, but it's all good. It's it's funny you mentioned the clothes. I just saw something where uh They've got this new service. If you're a Prime member, it's uh, it's Prime Wardrobe. So they're like stepping into the whole, uh, I guess, apparel business. Like when people, you know, purchase things at like, uh, um, I'm trying to think of some some services like Five Four Club or yeah. or things like that, where you they send you an outfit or something every month and you try on the pieces and if you like them, you keep them and pay for them. If not, you send them back. They're now doing that with all of the clothes that they sell on Amazon. Oh, I think I saw that. It was just today, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think I just saw that, that you can get like two or three pieces of things to try on and then at a time and then you can send them back or something. Yeah, that's going to be interesting. I am, you know, unfortunately neck deep in Amazon. I'm an Amazon junkie. I won't say her name because I'm talking to <laughs> you and we're recording and I'm in the room with her right now. But she is around all the time. <laughs> I, I have her in my kitchen. Yes. I have, I have a the little dot. It's mounted to the wall. Yeah. She's mostly about playing music. I travel a lot. And so checking weather in other places, yeah. um, things like that. So not too creepy. But And, and I claim buying any of these devices is, is research, right, for my job. I have to stay up on this sort of mm -hmm. thing. I have to know about these sorts of things. But um. They're useful and interesting tools. They're also a little scary, too, when you think about all of the data about me that's being passed around in all of these websites, devices, or whatever. It's a little staggering when you think about that, particularly with the security issues. And you know nobody's really got that under control, really, right? So, <laughs> I mean, people are I'm trying. The government barely has it under control, so yeah. Yeah, it's something else. It's a crazy time. But there you have it. I would imagine that probably almost any time in the history of human beings has been a crazy time to live. So we try to keep it together. One of the more recent posts that you had on Medium, and, and this is something I'm thinking about now as you brought up all this stuff with, with Amazon and such, it's about digital ethics. It's a fascinating kind of time to consider this right now because technology and design trends and business and everything are so interwoven and things are changing at such a rapid pace that, you know, what can end up happening is a lot of the work that ends up being created tends to be kind of ephemeral. Like you might think about devices that were really widely used 10 years ago that are now completely obsolete, you know, and with that, our work kind of ends up changing to try to keep up with that same, I don't know, evolutionary pace in a way. How do you kind of see digital ethics playing into all of this? I'll just sort of repeat probably what I have in that article. And I only meant one thing when I wrote that. And that is that the people who create online experiences oftentimes are not taking into consideration any ethical matters when they're developing. Mm -hmm. Right. And I mean, 
I can't say it any simpler than that, and that that's a mistake, and that the ethical components need to be considered fairly early on in the life cycle and by people who are ethicists, right, or philosophers, or who understand what could go wrong with technology. I think in that article I referenced Eric Fisher, who's a professor at, I think it's Arizona State University, and he has this methodology that he's developed called midstream modulation. And it's basically about getting into the stream of development, right, and making adjustments based on these ethical considerations. So instead of waiting until you've developed something all the way to the end, right, and then considering, like, what do we need to do, right, in order to make this sort of an ethical experience, bake mm -hmm. it in from the very beginning, right? And so that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to slow things down or that things have to be 100% pure or exactly right or a no offense zone or whatever. That decision about how edgy you want to be or ethical you want to be is a business decision, right? And so I would hope that most businesses would choose to be ethical, but we all know that ethics in businesses in the real world vary, right? And people make decisions about where they shop and don't shop based on those things. My concern is that they're not even being exposed. So people are creating products that at the end of the line do things like Twitter that they hadn't considered, mm. right? And so it might be that they would have Twitter worked just the way it worked and they would have changed nothing, but it would have been better if somebody had said, you do realize that somebody could do these four really bad things, right, with this technology and how might we counter that or do we want to proceed in this direction to have the conversation? Again, it goes back to having the conversation. People believe for some reason or another that having the conversation will lead to overly constrained or overly constricted development, right? And that's not necessarily the case unless you're a company that prides itself on being super ethical or prides, of, you know, and I'm not saying be unethical, saying there are different degrees of that, but not knowing and being blind to it and not even considering it and having a set of staff whose education is such that they don't even think like that, right? Where they're rewarded for the best algorithm and not rewarded for ethical concerns or even thinking about them. It's just a mistake. And then what actually happens, it's at the end of the line. So you've created all of this stuff and you've put it online and you find out, oh, it can do bad things, right? What ends up happening is the thing that nobody wants to happen, which is it gets over-regulated, right? Then it's out of the hands of actually the people who've created it and into the hands of people who probably don't understand technology, legislators, right? Writing up crazy legislation to kind of hold it back. And that's what nobody who works in the digital space, we all want to be free, right? We all want to be able to make the stuff that we want to make and we don't want to be over-regulated. That's the entrepreneurial spirit, right? That's true for any invention, right? You want to be free be, to be able to do things, but they don't want to be, have the accountability that ought to go on, along with that, which is, yeah, we're not going to overregulate you, but you have to put something in your process that makes you at least address ethics, right? Or mm. consider ethics. And this is not unreasonable. It's not okay to make a car that drives off the road by accident. It's yeah. just not okay, Right. Like, but people make new cars, people invent new cars all the time, new designs, new sorts of things. But it's baked in. Safety is baked into the car manufacturing culture. Right. And so, in fact, the whole autonomous driving and driverless car and all that kind of stuff is getting. That's where the issue is. Is it safe? Right. Or is it not safe? So it's not unreasonable. Now, cars weren't always like that. Right. Cars used to be crazy. Right. And it was through, you know, they used to not have seatbelts. Right. And some people might still complain about that kind of stuff. But I think it's culturally installed, at least in the U.S. and in a lot of countries in Europe that, you know, you put your seatbelt on. Right. And so it's, it's not an unreasonable path. And I think it's one that's going to have to be taken and one that obviously I'm talking about a lot. I feel really strongly about um, and one that makers need to own. Right. If we don't own it, we will be imposed upon by other people who don't understand what we do or understand how the technology works or understand what a database is or an API, right? Or an algorithm. They know those words, they have them in their vocabulary, but it's, there's kind of one step removed from it. So I think 
as a community deciding that, you know, there's a place in a development process where we consider the ethical implications of what we're making is just really a crucial thing. It's crucial. It's developmentally crucial, right? And it will happen eventually. It's just how bad does it have to get, right? (laughs) (laughs) Well, you know, I mean, how bad does it have to get before any type of safety correction get happens, right? In, you know, a real real world thing, right? Unfortunately, Enough people have to be killed or, or, or die tragically in order sometimes for people to react. And so in this case, when it has to do with politics or other types of social things, what has to happen? Like how bad does it have to get? And I think for most of us, particularly people in my age group who did not grow up with these channels, it's mind blowing. And we're a little bit seized up and don't know what to do. We don't actually have the tools We don't know how to counter this. Like if Mm -hmm. stuff happens in the real world, I know how to deal with the real world. I don't know, really know how to deal with this cyber bully. What do you do? Like, how do you even manage that? I didn't get taught that. I don't know how to do that. I don't have the skills. So that has to, needs to be invented, right? And I think digital natives and millennials can really help in this space because they feel more natural in it. And, you know, in some ways it's, it's their world and I'm not, being ageist against myself at all. It's just what I know how to do and and don't know how to do sort of as an individual. Now, I think I can add a lot of perspective, right? I think it's a full set. It's millennials and people who are older and it's going to be everyone. But I think just sort of the driving force of it, definitely because there are so many millennials in position of power in the digital space, they need to own this. And that's hard. It's hard to think about those sorts of things when you're in your 20s and 30s right? It's not the first thing you think about. Those are sort of like your go, 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 go years. And so I'm trying to add a little bit of, I guess I have to say mature voice to this <laughs> argument of like, yeah, we need to go, but can we close the doors and put our seatbelts on first, right? <laughs> like, and not be riding crazy. But no, I mean, all of that is certainly something I, I feel like now it's something that people are starting to take into consideration Honestly, largely because of this political climate that we're in right now and with the way that things are being dismantled and changed. I mean, at first, it's of course, it's, I think, energized a lot of people politically, but I think it's also gotten folks to think about the ethics behind their actions or the ethics behind certain companies, you know, to to use the, the hackney term woke. I think people are a lot more woke now than perhaps they were, you know, even a few years ago, which we'll see how that starts to play out. Like you said, I hope it gets to the point where these digital natives start thinking of, you know, ways to combat or either combat or, or come up with plans to fight a lot of this stuff. Like I'm I'm sort of at that at that nexus age. I'm 36. So I'm at that age where I grew up without the Internet. I mean, yeah, yeah. It, it, just, it, squeak, it squeaked in at, at, at the like you didn't have the Internet in elementary school in your classroom. Right. I didn't have the Internet until I got to I want to say high school, probably middle school or high school would be yeah, like middle school or high school. Yeah. But like I did have access to working with computers, just yeah. not, on that, you know, just not on that level. And I mean, it was to the point where I think we had I think we might have had like AOL or Net Zero or something in our house at one time. And I, and I remember my mother getting angry and getting rid of it and buying me a typewriter. <laughs> Why? What was her rationale? <laughs> and say, you're going to do it like I did all my papers all through high school. Oh, Ma, Ma, you can't hold it back. You can hold it back a little bit, but it's going to coming. It's coming. Well, I mean, this was like the mid nineties. It was at that time yeah. when there was certainly no kind of, uh, I don't well, know if well, that could work then. Yeah. The wild, wild West, in a way. My son is 22 years old, so he was uh-huh. born in 1995. Yeah, um, he was which, Yeah, but the thing was, even he didn't have the internet in the classroom in elementary school. Huh. It just oh, hadn't. Right. It just hadn't pushed. It just hadn't yeah, pushed yeah. that. It just hadn't pushed that deeply. This whole like iPad in the classroom stuff. Like they didn't even have iPads. There was no social. So he mm-hmm. he really. It's an interesting piece like the kids who are being born right now they're in it neck deep yeah. right they are in it neck deep it's going to be my son's children right who are like deep digital natives he's a digital native but mostly because his mother worked in the digital space and i didn't want him using my computer so he had his <laughs> own mac at the age of two oh, and he okay. had high speed internet connection that's unusual for somebody his age yeah 
right, to have had his own computer and whatever and, and playing computer games because I wanted to see these little kitty computer games or whatever. We living in Silicon Valley. And at the time, uh, what was the name of that company? I can't remember. They're in Emeryville, the kids toy company. Is it Leapfrog? Is that a toy company for kids? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I think they were relatively new and they had all these games and digital toys. And so Reese Viscott, my son, just got all these things just sort of thrown at him by me. Right. And he was downwind to my devices. Right. So every time I got a new device, which was almost every year, I'd have a different phone device. Right. I had a ricochet wireless modem that was the size of a brick that <laughs> I would take with my I don't know how many pounds laptop to the Oakland Coliseum to watch the Oakland A's on like it was either Dollar Tuesdays or Dollar Wednesdays. My son liked baseball and I knew nothing about it. So I slept all that stuff and had my wireless and slow modem while I sat in the cheap seats and ate dollar dog, dollar beer and dollar tickets and learned about the rules of baseball. So that was like in the like <laughs> mid late nineties. So this was his mom, right? So he just like, I realize now talking to other moms that other kids didn't have stuff like this. <laughs> they didn't have, have things like that at his age. So he got kind of digitally spoiled in that way. But yeah, it's going to take some time for this stuff to all mature through. And unfortunately, there's not a natural marriage between taking your time to consider the 360 degree possibility of good and evil mm -hmm. and youth. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> I mean, I wasn't reckless, but you just don't think like that when you're young. And the digital maker culture is a young culture, mm. right? It's a culture full of young people who aren't thinking about that. And not only that, they give it a bad name. Right. If you want to stop and consider things and they boost the rhetoric that this is fast paced. Here's the thing. Things do move quickly in the digital space. But I'm telling you, they don't move that fast. I mean, I work with organizations that, you know, have been talking about making a, the same mobile app during the entire 18 month project I'm working on with them. Right. It's not moving actually as fast as we think it is. I think because of, of the nature of disruption and the surprise of disruption and things like Amazon bought Whole Foods. Oh, my God. What does that mean? right? Things are popping, right? But when you look at it, if you were a grocery store, you've kind of been okay, right? Mm -hmm. Like maybe you need online ordering, but probably the vast majority of people still get in their car and go to the grocery store. Now these food kit things, that's a problem, right? Like, but that's relatively new for the most of the time it's been okay. So I think there just needs to be a little bit of perspective and people need to sort of temper their view on like how fast things are going and not going. They also need to realize that these quote unquote fast companies like Google and Amazon are monolithic, huge beasts. <laughs> They're not lightweight, fast moving anything, right? They're yeah. big global multinationals like a GE, right? <laughs> They're big, right? And so, um, and they've been around for 20 years. So I think just some adjustments in perspective are required right now. I mean, people like to sort of talk about generation, generation, you know, generations of the web in the digital space. And, and I hate doing that because who knows, that's all relative, right? But for me, I really feel like we're maybe really only hitting generation two, mm -hmm. right? Whereas people are like, we're on 97th generation because the first one was this and it's, you know, it's a limited perspective. And now I'm like, okay, push that clutch in, shift the gear, something wild's getting ready to happen now. And we've seen it in the political sphere. We're seeing it in more different vertical spaces. I think, you know, mobile was integral in that, right? Getting the internet off your house, out of your house and your screen and off your screen and into your pocket. That was it. That was something, right? So it's with me all the time and, you know, all this other kind of stuff. So it's going to be really, really fascinating. I'm really looking forward to seeing what happens over the next few years. And I'm hoping that the ethical component goes with it. It's not popular. Like everyone's talking about it. I'm not the only one talking about it. And I'm not the first one to talk about something like that. I was a philosophy major in school and I liked ethics. Ethics was something interesting to study. Ethics and semantics and logic, which is how I ended up being interested in the web in the first place and why the ethics are sort of creeping back, um, creeping back into it. But I think it's essential and it's going to happen one way or another, right? We're going to have to become more conscious conscious of how we are of what we're making and how we're making it and who it impacts and that's going to happen either in an easy way or a hard way and i think we've already started down the hard path so you may have missed the easy one 
I, I can't help but think about our our current government right now when it comes to you know a big slow moving organization that really needs to have some level of of governance. I've had people on the show before that have worked in the administration. I think most recently our 150th episode was with Ashley Axios, who's the the former creative director for the White House under the Obama administration. And I remember asking her, you know, this was right, let's say maybe a few months before the election. And I remember asking her, you know, whomever it is that gets into office, you know, how do you see kind of technology changing in terms of, you know, kind of the adoption rate of, of how the government uses it? You know, when Obama came into office, there were, I think, like just sweeping changes as it relates to technology and design with how it's used to communicate with, you know, citizens about things that are happening. You know, of course, there's there's slip ups, there's healthcare.gov and things of that nature. But there's also, you know, bigger things that they've tried to do, like uh, We the People. I think it's We the People dot gov, which is the online petition site and everything. And now we have a new president in office. And I, I can't help but wonder, of course, you know, we're, there's been all this stuff in the news about Russian meddling and scandals. And with that, there are a large number of vacancies in several different parts of of our government right now that are a lot of key positions that are unfilled. Even when it comes down to like the website, I remember maybe within the first month or two, there were all this talk about, oh, well, this page that was on the website, now it's gone. And this other page about, you know, this, that, or the other is gone. And it makes me think, who is running the show over there? What is it that they need right now besides people? They need just people to, to handle this stuff. But I'm often wondering if with this current administration, if we're not taking like a big step back as it relates to just technology and and things like that, because they don't have the people there, I don't know who's responsible, you know? Well, I mean, so, yes, we have a governance problem in the U.S. right now, and it's a real world governance problem and online governance problem. The government has a governance problem. I have, you know, some of the earliest work that I did in digital governance was actually with the U.S. federal government. I did a project with what what is now USA.gov, which used to be FirstGov, like in 2001, so quite some time ago. They were implementing, I think, their first ever web content management system, which was Vignette. But that's a whole other different story that I don't know that it had a good ending. But anyhow, Vignette was a rough tool towards the end. But there, we, there you have it. Yes, there are governance concerns. But and my, my point of all this is, you know, I worked with a lot of large agencies in the governmental space, and it's tough. It's a tough road to hoe. But one of the things that I would always mention when I was talking about governance, because at that time I was just starting to say governance, and there was a woman, Candace Harrison, Candy, who uh, worked at, I want to say HUD, I think it was HUD, who was talking a lot about web governance at that time. And it was mostly about content governance, right? The governance of content and how do you manage content and who's making decisions about what content goes online. So she was super early in that as well. And I started thinking more about governance of all the channels. But one of the points that I like to make to people in the government at the time was that it's really important to have a, a governing framework for the web and for more lately, all of your digital and online channels because of the way government works, which means the administration changes, right? And so with the absence of a governance framework that's actually gives clarity around what must and must not happen online for a particular agency or for the government at large, what happens is what happens online is at the mercy and discretion of whoever is in office. And that's exactly what we're seeing, right? Yeah. So some of that's maturity, right? Some of that is just any big organization making a transition are going to have these types of changes. So some of that is just not about the politics of it. It's just the nature of large, large systems. But part of it is there are no policies in place about what the government must and must not do online. What happens is that it gets extrapolated from policy that's about the real world, much as when the early records retention policies, online records retention policies came out from NARA, they were basically saying online content is like real world content, right? There's no such thing as a record that's an online record. An online record is only a digital version of a real world record, which actually precluded things like web only content. 
And even at the time that that came out, I can't even remember when that was. It, maybe I'm making it up. So it could be completely wrong. 2004, 5, 6, 7, somewhere in there in the 2000s when that came out. It was ludicrous because we knew from working with clients, there's all kinds of web only content, right? That was about the same time the first Bush administration lost a bunch of email. It wasn't a big deal at that time, right? And I remember being going, wow, why isn't anybody upset that a bunch of email got lost from the White House, right? And Mm -hmm. so we've just been all over the place with this all the time. It's a really easy mark right now because we've got a real squeaky wheel in the White House right now and all (laughs) kinds of crazy stuff. And there's data being removed. Some of it's intentional. I remember everyone really being up in arms the day after the inauguration this year when, you know, the websites for the White House changed and all this information came down. Well, that was intentional, right? A few days before that happened, the White House and the, the digital office actually published a very interesting piece on how they were going to archive the Obama administration's White House website, which is a good thing, right? You want that to be archived intact, right? You don't want that to be messed with later on. You wanted what and how an administration represented the White House online. You want that to be parked and non-negotiable, right? And so that's what happened. So a lot of people sort of misinterpreted the removal of some information as being an aggressive thing when it was actually an archiving thing. Nonetheless, there's plenty of crazy to go around. So if not that one, other things. So it's a huge challenge for the government. I don't think it's ever really decided what digital governance means, right, for the U.S. federal government. And so that means, as you know, I mentioned at the start of sort of my rant, it's at the discretion of whoever is in office, right, because there is no right or wrong. And there's not always a direct corollary between what happens in the real world and what happens online. It's different beasts. So that's a conversation that needs to be had, I think, at a fairly high level and sort of put right. Don't think it's going to happen in this administration. I don't think they have the palate for it, right, or the desire. But right. it needs to happen. Um, it needs to happen soon. <laughs> Let's kind of switch gears here. I know we, we've spent a lot of time talking about some pretty heady subjects. Hopefully people are, I'm sure people are still listening. No, at this they're point. not. They are. They are. They listen. <laughs> they listen. You've been on vacation for what, the past three months now? I did. I took a vacation for three months, which was a reward for having raised a child from birth to 22 and generally worked hard for the last 30 years. So I did. I took a vacation. Amen. How was it? Where did you go? It was good. It was good. Well, I did. I just put up a blog post called Resting. In the middle of it, somebody asked me to write a a post, an article on productivity. So that was funny. Somebody (laughs) asked me to write productivity. I I went to New Zealand and Bali and Senegal. Wow. Yeah. So it was a it was a good trip. I got a lot of time. I'm I'm thinking about writing another book and I really wanted to figure out what I might want to write about. And it was just sort of too noisy. It was all instigated. Good folks at Webstock in uh, New Zealand and in Wellington asked me if I would give a talk there. And I figured if I was going to go all the way to New Zealand, which is a long way into that part of the world, I might as well make the most of it. And there was a hole in my calendar. So I did that. So it's a great trip. I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed being in place where people use the internet differently. I enjoy being places where I don't speak the language, where there's strong cultural variances from what I'm used to. And I also enjoy noticing how similar people are globally as well. Um, I think that's the best part of travel for me is understanding that people generally want the same things in their lives and the same types of not literal comforts, but sort of heart comforts of, you know, family and love and companionship and safety and things like that. So I really enjoyed it. Yeah, there's something about travel that just, I don't know, it can sometimes be a good hard reset on anything that you might be stressed out about or dealing with at the time. Something about, I don't know, maybe it's just the the act of moving through a space kind of helps out with with that. I mean, I was just in Chicago for, I don't know, maybe like a week or so. And I mean, it was work. I was there with a client, but I came back and was energized with ideas. Even though I was working the whole time I was there, I just came back and was like, I was not in the space that I normally was. And it just, I don't know, it just opened something up in me, opened something up in my mind where I could, you know, access something I hadn't thought about before. Well, I think that's true. And, you know, one of the things about 
traveling and I tend to rent places because I like to cook my own food. So I'm usually not in a hotel and I was in a series of cabins and then a B and B at the end when I was in Senegal, which was really quite nice. I, I really enjoyed it. Is it just sort of strips a lot of things that are in your life away from you. So I don't yeah. have my house. So there's a lots of things in my house that I do. I play the piano a lot. Like right now I'm making a quilt out of fabric that I got in Senegal and when I was in Bali. But there are just all kinds of ways to stay busy in your house. And when you don't have that, when you travel, particularly if you're a month at a time in a place, it strips all of those things off of you. And that's kind of cool because you start to actually realize what you actually like and don't like mm -hmm. and what is necessary and not really necessary. And I think that, for me, is where the sort of rejuvenation comes from, just a sense of you can come back home and go, you know, OK, this part's unnecessary. Let me get rid of that. It helps you sort of simplify things helps you feel really grateful for what you have and the things in your house that you really do love. Like, I love my piano. It is the thing that I miss when I'm away, right? And so it helps you to appreciate those things and gain perspective, helps you understand where your privilege is, which I've always known that I've had just by sort of growing up in the U.S., you get some default um, privilege from being in this country when you look at things from a global perspective. But, you know, just access to food, access to the internet, all those sorts of things. So I really enjoyed it. And it was eye opening for me and refreshing. What keeps you motivated with the work that you do? Because it sounds like with digital governance, like you said, it's a lot of kind of going into a space and kind of uncovering, I don't know, the processes and things that need to be put in place. What keeps you inspired with this work? It's the capacity. It's, oh, it's the same thing that brought me to it from the very, very beginning, which is the capacity for improving people's lives. So right now, I feel like we're a little bit in a dark spot with the internet because we're, you know, figuring out that you know, we got the keys to the car and we're figuring out, yeah, it can run off the road, right? And things like that. But the possibility for knowledge dissemination, for enhancements in healthcare, for unifying the global family, that's amazing, right? And so there are no people, some people who don't think those are good things, Right. But I think they're good things. And so I think maturing the way that we use digital is integral into us really being able to take advantage of everything that the Internet and the Web have to offer. I mean, the Internet and the Web could be privately owned, but they're not. Right. That in of itself just feels like a miracle right? <laughs> that, that we get handed this thing. And so my thing is, yeah, I have to make a living and I want to help companies learn how to govern their online channels well. But I more want to, you know, just sort of as a as a human being, want to make sure that we manage this really amazing tool well, because I think it can really kind of bring us up to the next level in terms of the way human beings treat each other, talk to each other and how we all live. What do you think you would have been doing if you never got into all of this? <clears throat> oh, wow. The thing that I was doing when I got into web was being an opera singer. <laughs> but I gave up on that and writing. So I still write some and still writing essays. I don't know. I mean, that's a good question. I've always been interested in sort of uh, the causes. So I, I don't know. I don't know that I can answer that question. I'm not much of a uh, what if kind of person, if that makes sense. I tend to, uh, you know, I have my moments where I go, dang, I should have done that. You know, like that I meant or that was a missed opportunity. But for the most part, I'm a little bit pragmatic and I see little value in reflecting on what I could have been because I think yeah. that takes energy away from what I still have the opportunity to become. Right. So I, I don't know that I have a good, good answer for that. Okay. Where do you see yourself in the next, let's say five years or so? What do you think you'll still be working on? I think I will be writing more. I'm, I'm working on an, another book that I'm not quite ready to, to talk about yet because I'm, I don't like to talk about writing projects when I'm sort of generating them because I like to sort of get it in a, a good seed form first. Um, so I think I'll be writing more. I think I'll be broadening the types of things that I'm talking about, still probably a lot in the digital space, but sort of from a different angle and maybe even through a different lens. I'd like to continue to do that, to scale back a little bit on the consulting. I still enjoy working with people. It sort of keeps my mindset real, but maybe more focused on a client set that are I'm more personally interested in helping support their use of digital channels than just taking sort of anyone that comes along. Although, you know, I've enjoyed my work. I feel really fortunate to have been able to do the work that I do, work with the types of organizations that I work with and work with so many amazing people. People are generally good. 
may not have had a few jerks here and there, but as a general rule, <laughs> people are really are really good to work with and want to solve problems. So it's been good. I hope to continue continue doing that work. Well, just to wrap things up here, where can our audience find out more about you and about your work and your books and everything online? I have a lisawelchman.com website that I'm going to say that thing I said, don't say. That's basically a business card website. It doesn't have, but you can get in touch with me there. There's a contact form for speaking and things like that. And you can access my book. There are links to my book, Managing Chaos, there. A colleague and I just put up digitalgovernance.com earlier this year. And that's basically an education site. So if you want to read some more about digital governance, what it is, um, there is a sort of a, a roll of articles there that comes out. We put something out new every week. Some of them are excerpts of my book. Some of them are new things, fresh things. And we have a, an alert service that people can sign up for there. I'm trying to think what else. Um, Medium, I do some long form blogging on Medium from time to time. Usual places, LinkedIn. I'm not much of a tweeter. But I am on Twitter, and I do occasionally have conversations with people people on Twitter. I'm more of a lurker on Twitter. I have a really good Twitter feed. so <laughs> I, I have curated my Twitter feed. Most people just follow anybody, right, randomly. I've actually curated my Twitter feed, so it's very amusing and interesting. But those are the places you can reach me. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, you have to start from the beginning. <laughs> you have to st- I did. I, same thing with LinkedIn. Like, Almost, I would say 95% of the people who I am linked into on LinkedIn, I've actually shook their hand. Like, That's a good policy. I just don't link into any. So it's like it's LinkedIn. I, it's like I may forget some of them. I may be only with them once at an event and we exchange cards or something or, or info. But um, they're people that I, I definitely know. And so I like that aspect of it, human, human part. But it means I'll never have – I'll never be like a social giant. But that's Okay. <laughs> I, I need to clean out my LinkedIn because at one point in time I was doing that. I was only adding people that I had worked with or I had known personally, like I met them at an event or something. And I don't know. I think, oh, I'll tell you what happened. I started this podcast and then I get maybe 20 to 30 LinkedIn requests every week. And it's like, I mean, some of them are like, oh, love your podcast. I'm like, yeah, that's great. I'm, you know, I don't want to be a jerk and. <laughs> not add them but i've probably got about 50 people sitting in my in my invites and i'm like who is this again it's hard to separate yourself from your podcast yeah and then i'll look at my linkedin feed and i'm like wait a minute who is this i'm celebrating they're celebrating what What? yeah (laughs) that's all right it's it's a done deal i I don't think you should go back i think it's too late (laughs) It's 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 like it's not like you can actually make any discerning judgments it sounds like, cause you don't even know who they are. And you know, most of the time you meet people and then you forget their name. Like you met them only once and they might be somebody you want to be linked into or whatever. Plus LinkedIn changed. Like LinkedIn didn't used to be so complicated and confusing, but like that's no. a whole nother thing. Let's not talk about that because you can blame Microsoft for that. they bought them. You so. know what? I can, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not going to blame. I'm not going to cast any blame. I'll just say it's not optimal. How's that? <laughs> That is that is very true. Well, Lisa Welshman, thank you so much for for coming on the show. Thank you for sharing this this wealth of information. There's so many things in here that we've we've talked about, whether it's been digital ethics or governance or even the Estonia e residency, which I'm totally yeah, you're on that. I can tell. (laughs) This has just been such an enlightening conversation. I really hope uh, for people that are listening that they get a lot out of it and hopefully find out more about digital governance and why it's important and how they can use it uh, within their organization. So thank you so much for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. It was fun. Thoughts of love are in and that's it for this week. Big thanks to Lisa Welchman and thanks to you for listening. You can find out more about Lisa and her work through the links in the show notes at revisionpath.com. Also, thanks as always to our sponsors, Facebook Design, MailChimp, Hover, and SiteGround. Facebook designers work on creative products that are used by over 2 billion people. 2 billion! Their mission is to make the world more open and connected, and they use design to create prototypes, shape experiences, and ultimately solve problems as well. Learn more about Facebook Design at facebook.com forward slash design. Whether you need to sell your product, share some big news, or just tell a story, MailChimp makes it easy to create campaigns that best suit your message. You know your business. Let MailChimp help you grow it. 
Visit MailChimp.com and sign up for a free account today. MailChimp. Send better email. Every great idea deserves a great domain name, and Hover takes all the hassle and confusion out of buying and managing domains. Hover also offers free private domain registration, your choice of hundreds of domain extensions, and you can connect domains to your favorite web service. Ready to get started? Go to hover.com forward slash revision path and get 10% off your purchase. Since 2004, SiteGround has been empowering web professionals and beginners alike to build better, faster, safer websites easily without having to worry about hosting. Visit SiteGround.com forward slash revision path to get 60% off on all hosting plans. SiteGround, web hosting crafted with care. This episode was edited by RJ Basilio and produced by me, Maurice Cherry. Our intro voiceover is by Music Man Dre with intro and outro music by Yellow Speaker. If you liked this episode, please do me a huge favor. Subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and leave us a rating and a review. It only takes a minute or two and it really, really, really helps the show out by bumping us up in the rankings there for design podcasts and I'll even read your review right here on the show. Revision Path is brought to you by Lunch, a multidisciplinary creative studio in Atlanta, Georgia. Visit us at yepitslunch.com for all your design, strategy, and creative consulting needs. And if you like the work that we're doing here with Revision Path, then please consider becoming a patron. You know, we're coming up on 200 episodes this month. That is a phenomenal achievement. And now more than ever, Revision Path needs your support to make sure that stories about black designers and creatives in our field are being told in their own words. So if you support us, if you support our mission, if you support what we're doing here for the design community, just go to patreon.com forward slash revision path and pledge today. Pledge levels start at just $1 per month and you'll get access to behind the scenes information about the show, upcoming interviews, and so much more. Thanks so much for listening and we'll see you next time.